the learning outcomes of this module. So after studying this module, you should be able to know the various affective skills, understand the meaning of empathy, learn the cycle of empathic skillfulness, have an insight into empathic responding and know about other specific affective techniques. Let us first introduce you to the topic of affective skills. In the previous module, we have discussed the nature of affective skills, the role of emotions in therapy, the overview of process of dealing with affect and body and analysis of various dimensions of emotions in a client. In this section, we will continue forward and discuss the other significant affective skills. First, we will emphasize upon the importance of affective skill that is the empathy. Later, we will discuss other specific skills such as congruence, unconditional positive regard and rational emotive imagery. Let us now elaborate on the core affective skill, empathy. Usually, clinicians use a combination of affective, behavioral and cognitive skills simultaneously. Empathy is one of the most significant therapeutic skills. It is however most difficult to achieve and to learn. It requires combination of communication skills and insight and sensitivity towards the client. It is sometimes also referred as a composite skill requiring affective, behavioral and cognitive awareness of the client. Empathy is both a trait and a skill. Some people already possess it as an ability to be concerned about others' feelings, care about them, identify with them and yet keep personal distress to a minimum. When this is translated into helping behavior, it is used as a skill and can be beneficial for the therapeutic process. Hence, it is also considered as a basic skill for all mental health care providers as it is required for all therapeutic work. Rogers in 1980 considered sensitive, accurate and active listening as the most significant factor in therapy. It involves deeply understanding the inner perspective of the client and using that understanding to increase his self-awareness and growth. It means to provide the internal frame of reference of the other person accurately along with affect and meaning. It is also different from sympathy as sympathy involves feeling pity for someone, making clients feel victimized. Empathy usually involves genuine reflection of feeling and making the person feel empowered with the counsellor. Brems 2002 identifies certain prerequisite skills for empathic skillfulness. These are perspective taking, absence of over identification, low levels of personal distress, acceptance, respect, interpersonal warmth, genuineness, congruence, self-awareness, rapport building skills, communication facilitation skills, ability to understand non-verbal communication, ability to communicate understanding to the client, cognitive flexibility, creativity, ability to conceptualize client's thoughts, affects and behaviors. Now let us understand the process of empathic skillfulness. Barrett Leonard 1981 conceptualized empathy as a process that is similar to empathic skillfulness. This empathic process has been described as cyclical and consists of multiple phases or stages. The process mentioned herein has five stages. In phase one, the client expresses his emotions verbally or non-verbally. In the second phase, the clinician interprets it accurately, that is, he receives the message 
and interprets it accurately. The third phase involves understanding the message. The fourth stage involves giving feedback of their understanding to the client. And lastly, the fifth stage involves the client feeling heard and understood. The figure shows the cycle of empathic skillfulness. An empathic response helps a client feel assured that he is being actively listened to and understood by the clinician and makes the client more self-aware. In phase 1 is the expression by the client. The clinician encourages the client to share issues of concern with him. He uses his communication skills for this purpose. The client may express himself verbally and non-verbally which needs to be keenly observed by the clinician. Clinician should not be judgmental or prejudiced in his views. Next comes the phase 2 which involves receiving of the messages by the counsellor. The clinician sieves through a lot of information coming from the client to filter out the important message by the client. Factors such as being evaluative, selective, fact-centered, caught up in the client's emotions, hindered in receiving the message accurately. Hence, counsellor needs to be physically, psychologically and emotionally adequate to receive the message. For this to be accurate, clinicians need to be self-aware and identify their own biases, beliefs, values, stereotypes and expectations. Next we come to the phase 3 that is interpreting the message. The therapist now makes a sense of what the client has communicated. Each clinician depending on his school of thought will make meaning of the client's affect, behaviors and thoughts. The clinician needs to be very careful in this phase as accurate meaning will help develop better rapport and trust. The client's history, family history, cultural belongingness and values are also considered while constructing the meaning of the client's self-disclosure. Next we come on to phase 4 that is the feedback to the client. The clinician now responds in a genuine, warm and respectable manner. This response is not only cognitive but also affective. The cognitive component shows the understanding of the clinician and affective component is stating his understanding in a very caring manner. The clinician may use language easily understood by the client, avoiding difficult words and jargons and not use technical language. Also. Certain nonverbal cues that communicate empathy and nonverbal expression showing concern for the client's well being, paying careful attention to the client's nonverbal reactions is important. Phase 5 comes as receiving of the message by the client. The client needs to be physically and psychologically ready to receive the feedback from the clinician. This would require a certain level of cognitive ability of the clinician. The clinician also needs to understand the right time to give this feedback, to have the right amount of impact on the client. The client will feel cared, understood, affirmed and acknowledged. Such kind of empathic skillfulness can have curative effects and help clients grow out of their conflicts. The table given here emphasizes some of the skills required in each phase of empathic skillfulness. For example, in the phase 1 that is expression by the client, the skills required are facilitation of self-disclosure, attending skills and basic communication skills. In phase 2 that is reception by the clinician, the skills required are being psychologically functional, good active listening skills and avoiding biases, prejudices, expectations etc. In phase 3 that is understanding by the clinician, the skills required are knowledge of theoretical system, understanding contextual factors such as family, socioeconomic status, 
culture etc. In phase 4 that is expression by the clinician the skills required are avoiding difficult words and jargons, showing warmth, care and comfort, emphasizing understanding and not explaining and phase 5 that is reception by the client the skills required are maintaining eye contact and attention of the client and assessing readiness of the client and accurate reception by the client. Hammond in 1977 in his book entitled Improving Therapeutic Communication has developed an empathic communication scale. This scale moves from level 1 to level 5 wherein level 1 is the lowest form of empathic communication and level 5 is highest in empathic communication. The details of each level is given in the table. Level 1 means counsellors verbal and behavioural responses are irrelevant, lacking significantly in affect and content. Level 2, counsellor responds only to the surface feelings, subtracts affect and distorts the meaning. Level 3, understanding of feelings expressed by client but do not go below the surface. Level 4 means counsellor accurately identifies underlying feelings beyond the expression of the client and level 5 which means the highest level of empathic skillfulness means counsellor significantly adds affect and meaning explicitly expressed by the client. Now let us come to some specific affective techniques. First one is congruence. The skill of a counsellor to be genuine, authentic, well integrated and aware of themselves and how they are perceived by others together are referred to as congruence. Congruence helps the counsellor to transmit clear and coherent messages as their inner selves and outer selves are not in a conflict. A therapist should bring his true self in the therapeutic relationship and not put a facade to develop rapport and trust with the client. This also involves a sync with whatever is being expressed by the client and the understanding of the clinician is getting of it. The clinician responds simultaneously. His concerns are real and genuine and responses are congruent. Hence, the therapist becomes a role model who influences the client in a positive manner without any deception or hidden agendas. Congruence requires openness, self-awareness and sensitivity on part of the clinician. They also need to be actively involved in the therapeutic session and be aware of their environment and interactions. The environment should be non-threatening. In addition, congruency implies a consistency between the verbal and non-verbal messages given by the counsellor. Coming on to the next technique, unconditional positive regard. Another affective skill significant for effective counselling is the unconditional positive regard. Rogers gave the term unconditional positive regard and it implies caring about, respecting, liking and accepting people for who they are without placing any requirements on them to act, feel or think in certain ways to please their clinicians. He considered people as inherently worthy even though they may have positive and negative impulses. He believed that when this warmth and positive regard is communicated, people start liking themselves, develop sense of self-worth, feel empowered to cope with problems and become more fully functional. It does not mean that whatever people do is appropriate, but assumes that it is done to the best of their ability at this time. One may question and doubt a person's choices, but needs to accept and have confidence in the person. Example, rather than saying, you seem to be an angry person, it should be said that you sounded angry at the cancellation of the appointment. Such conversations are helpful in making a client trust their own feelings and thoughts as these are not evaluative in nature. 
The client begins to feel that he can change his undesirable behaviors, thoughts and feeling without experiencing guilt or shame. The more a person is given positive messages and valued, the more likely he will change his undesirable behaviors. Another specific technique in affective skills is the rational emotive imagery. The aim of rational emotive imagery is to change negative and unhealthy emotions into positive healthy ones. The clients are taught this exercise and need to practice regularly on their own. Thompson 2003 gives the following steps of REI that is rational emotive imagery. The first step is visualizing an unpleasant activating event. In this the client is told to picturize himself or fantasize as vividly and intensely as they can the details of some unpleasant activating experience which is called as A that has just happened or will likely to occur in future. Example, I befriended someone named Chris on the net. We exchanged mails and decided to meet for dinner date. I waited for long in the shivering cold outside but he did not come. The next step in this activity is experiencing the unhealthy negative emotion. The counselor says as you imagine this episode let yourself feel any strong emotion that comes up for you. This is called as C or the emotional consequence of this exercise. Really feel those feelings and get in touch with them. Do not try to avoid the feelings or change them. Just face them and feel them. Example, I felt sick and disgusted with myself. I felt overwhelming shame. I felt very angry with Chris. Next comes the third stage, changing the emotions. After these feelings are experienced for a few minutes, now you need to push yourself to change the feelings to feel different from inside. You can replace disgust, shame and anger with disappointment or annoyance. Do this exercise until you experience a shift in your feelings. Example, I know it is difficult but I will do it anyways. I feel annoyed as I had to spend so much time in this person and he ignored me. I had many expectations out of this relationship. Fourth stage of this process that is examining the process. You are now successful in changing your self-destructive emotions of shame and anger to appropriate feelings such as disappointment and annoyance. This happened as you change your belief system B which mediated between the activating event A and the emotional consequence C. Example, earlier I felt I was hopeless failure. It was really humiliating. But now I think it is good that I really didn't get interested in him and later discovered what he was really like. I think I will find other ways to meet people besides the internet. Next comes the stage of repetition and practice. Keep repeating the process, imagine the scene, elicit the negative feelings and the change of your feelings to calm and not disturbed. This should be practiced regularly until it comes easy to you. Next comes the stage of reinforcing the goal. Later, as one becomes proficient, the activating event will not elicit the feelings of rage and shame. Rather, displeasure and disappointment will be easily experienced. Finally, last comes the stage of generalization of skills. This technique can be used for other situations also. Hence, Affective skills relate to the clinician's self-awareness, sensitivity, empathy, being congruent and having unconditional positive regard for the client. These skills become necessary for effective therapy to take place. It helps develop healthy, trustworthy relationship between the client and the clinician. It also helps the client change and grow. The clinician in practicing these skills become proficient in his role as a counselor. Now let us summarize what all we have learnt in this module.
clinicians use a combination of affective behavioral and cognitive skills simultaneously empathy is one of the most significant therapeutic skills it is however most difficult to achieve and learn it requires a combination of communication skills and insight and sensitivity towards the client it is sometimes also referred as a composite skill requiring affective behavioral and cognitive awareness of the client empathy is both a trait and a skill some people already possess it as an ability to be concerned about others feelings care about them identify with them and yet keep personal distress to a minimum when this is translated into helping behavior it is used as a skill and can be beneficial for the therapeutic process hence it is also considered as a basic skill for all mental health care providers as it is required for all therapeutic work we also learned about the cycle of empathetic skillfulness this process has five phases in phase 1 the client expresses his emotions in second phase the clinician interprets it accurately the third phase involves understanding the message fourth stage involves giving feedback of their understanding to the client and lastly the fifth stage involves feeling heard and understood the other significant affective skills that we learned in this module are congruence unconditional positive regard and the use of rational emotive imagery congruence is the skill of the counselor to be genuine authentic well integrated and aware of themselves and how they are perceived by others together are referred as congruence congruence helps the counselor to transmit clear and coherent messages as their inner and outer selves are not in conflict unconditional positive regard implies caring about respecting liking and accepting people for who they are without placing any requirements on them to act feel and think in certain ways to please their clinicians here people are considered as inherently worthy even though they may have positive and negative impulses the therapist is also trained and uses the skill of rational emotive imagery it is used to change negative and unhealthy emotion into positive healthy ones the clients are taught this exercise and need to practice regularly on their own hence affective skills are significant in developing essential rapport between the client and the therapist the sense of trust and concern of care experienced by the client will provide the right environment for self disclosure hence the therapist will be able to guide the client accurately in a genuine manner resulting in change and growth in the client and the therapist